this event, but really it's about all you people coming together. Um, I'm just going to give you logistics. We're obviously a little bit behind, but that's not too bad. Um, everyone should have a program. So if you don't, you maybe want some. There's also some of these Reclaim Brixton maps that you might want. So I'll maybe just probably the people at the back need them. So we have a whole bunch of them, so feel free to, and there's some other maps around, and we put some maps up around that some of the groups have been working on. Um, so we have three specific three, uh, themes that we're going to be looking at, basically mapping violence, participatory mapping, and then mapping London's housing struggle. So there's going to be some overlap for this. So as we have a lot of information that we're going to be trying to communicate and really want a lot of dialogue as well. We're going to try to keep the presentations quite short. So um, our presenters have the task of describing and introducing their maps in about five to seven minutes. So we're going to have three presenters, and then we're going to collect some questions from the audience. Um, so when we collect the questions, it'd be best if you either do it on the theme of that panel or on a specific map, because we're going to try to keep most of the time to the end until you've seen all of the different maps. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to have the presentations, have some questions, and then a larger discussion at the end. Um, also, so if you have any more specific general questions that you want to have at the back of the program, you'll see a place for taking notes. So you might want to write down your question there and save it to the end, and then we can pose it towards all of the presenters then. Um, washrooms are a long trip around the back. I think if you keep following the corridors and going through doors, you come to bathrooms. <laughs> so there's usually the human symbols, so go into one of them. Um, the other thing, we're going to be filming, and we have a live stream, but we weren't the most, well, it's, it's live streaming, but we don't know if anyone knows it's on live streaming. So we'll make you. Yeah, so, yeah, just be on your phone. That will make me feel or like I'm teaching. Or you're a Twitter, and you could, or a Facebook, or you're like, you're, you're decide to get distracted if you could Facebook or tweet that we're live streaming mm -hmm. so that people know. Yeah. That would be that would be great. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, the hashtag is whatever we just the decided. Small little there. maps for justice. So four with the number uh, instead. So if you want you can tweet as well. Um, so we will be filming during it. We're not going to pan the audience or anything like that. So if you don't want your audio, if you ask a question and you don't want your audio recorded, um, maybe let us know. Or you could also have someone else write down the question if you didn't want your voice recorded. But basically, it's going to be uh, presenters. So also presenters, if you really don't want to be on film, let us know that now. So we're going to get started right away. Um, the first panel is going to be mapping violence. And we're going to have three different people who are talking about how they critically use maps in order to understand issues of violence that have been going on. So I'll have the presenters come up. I'll police the time. Um, and then we'll have we'll take questions after that. So I'm going to kick us off by way of kind of introducing the project that has brought everyone together and sort of where my own mapping practice kind of brought me to the project. Um, so we are here because of, oh, is it here still? Home. We're here because of a new initiative at Bournemouth University called the Civic Media Hub, um, and we've got some grant funding for a project called Data Labs, which is about trying to bridge what we see as an emerging data divide between the kinds of digital tech skills, surveillance, and mapping projects that corporations and uh, organizations with a lot of power are able to do, but that third sector humanitarian, um, smaller investigative journalists, uh, and those of us working in other kinds of advocacy and activist groups don't always have the access, the time, the resources, or the skills. And so uh, trying to bring bridge those people together and do skill sharing and do some sort of data projects. And my desire to do this came out of an accidental map that I found myself making. Uh, I'm doing a quite deep investigative project on the past hundred years of the use of tear gas. And one of the things about tear gas is that First of all, many people don't know it's been used for 100 years, um, and second of all, we, we think of it, it flares up in the news, it's in the news almost every day, but we have no real sense of like where it's being used or how much. And so I started a Google map just as a way, I was on a postdoc, so I had a lot of free time, um, 
And, was, and, and time is really important, as other people will talk about, the, the amount of time it takes to do these kinds of projects can be really intense. And so just as a way of collecting data that wasn't just like recording it into a spreadsheet or putting it into a Word document, I was like, hey, why don't I use Google Maps? And I can just read the news, make a point, and record the story. So all this is, is I, would, I got a Google alert for the keyword tear gas, and every time there was a new tear gas incident, and I used the parameter of it being mass tear gassing, so not, not the use of just a spray against a single person, but a group of people, um, and that was somewhat arbitrary just as a way to have a sort of defined parameters. Um, I, I would just take a major incident from a reliable news source, and instead of writing it down, I would stick it as a pin into Google Maps. And I wasn't planning to share this or to show it to anyone. It was really just a way for me to keep myself entertained as I did this really tedious task of uh, meticulously every week or sometimes every few weeks going through my Google alerts and mapping all of the incidences of, of tear gas. Uh, I started to also use Twitter a little bit to verify or look for places that weren't being located. Um, but then this you know, strange thing happened where people started to view the map and then all of a sudden I like, looked back at the map and the map had like 10,000 hits and then it had like 20,000 hits and I was like, oh, okay, I guess I have like created something here. And, and then I started to realize that there were these other kinds of ways that the map um, could be used. And so one was that, oh, lost this. Okay, lost that, I just talked about it. Uh, one was that it could be used by other groups doing other kinds of advocacy work. Uh, and so this is, um, an arms control blog that follows arms control log, um, talking about how um, that that the stri most striking thing that he had found was the compilation and mapping of tear gas. And of course, when you make a map, it's very easily reproducible, embeddable. It works both as an image and as an interactive. And so that um, started to happen. Hopefully, this link will open. Ah. And then I did a story for Atlantic, among some other media stories I've been doing, and when I can approach and pitch to a journalist and say, hey, I also have this interactive map, all of a sudden the story becomes a lot more viable, a lot more willing to run it. And so, again, the amount of circulation that this got through being featured in this Atlantic article uh, recirculated that map and, and gave the story a kind of traction that it wouldn't have had otherwise. Uh, and the other thing I realized that could happen was that I could give the data from the map, because really I was using map as a form of data collection, to people who actually knew <coughs> what they were doing, who got very mad at me because I had not recorded my data properly, and I had to learn very quickly what things like KLM and CSV meant, and, the, and it really started to make me realize like how much we speak in acronyms and we don't necessarily under, even understand the basics of the language that each other are using to do these kinds of skills. Um, and so I, a, a lovely, uh, Matt Alice, a lovely graduate um, student, um, made me these pretty Cardo DB maps, some of which do not work on Internet Explorer, um, which we, of course, because of proprietary software, cannot access anything else from this computer, um, which is the thing <laughs> that we've been talking about a bit today. Um, so he used Cardo DB, which is a great and, and has uh, fairly accessible um, software, but of course only some of it is not behind a paywall um, to make these prettier versions maps. And so it brought up to me that all of a sudden this accidental thing that was just about me trying to not be bored during my research process became something that was this really, really powerful tool for public engagement, for shifting policy conversations, and for producing data sources that other researchers and students could use. And so I thought, hey, I bet a bunch of other people have thought about this stuff too. Uh, what, what would it look like to try to get some money to bring them together? Um, and this was born, and we are, we are here. So that is my story of my map and why we are sitting uh, in this room. Uh, so I'll pass it on to our next map maker. Oh, it's Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm Jack Searle. I'm from the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Uh, we are a non-profit organization, um, and I work on the um, Drones Project. So we record CIA and US Special Forces drone strikes in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. We've been doing it for about four years. They've been doing it since 2002. Um, and this began life very much as a process of recording individual strikes and recording um, the number of people who have been killed. And this is the most recent one, um, Monday night. Uh, four or five people were killed in a particular area of Pakistan um, called the Federally Administered Tribal Areas. 
we never really approached this as a sort of a, as a mapping project per se. This was much more about trying to find out who was being killed in drone strikes. There was this narrative from Washington that the drones were surgically precise. There was a lot of imagery of scalpels, of lasers, of Al-Qaeda being a cancer, of Al-Qaeda being a disease, being excised from the body without leaving any damage to the surrounding tissue, all that sort of thing. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, reporting was, uh, uh, reports were coming out of Pakistan of civilians being killed um, relatively frequently. Uh, and there was a disconnect between the uh, established line from uh, Washington and the reported reality on the ground. However, it was very um, uh, ad hoc. It wasn't uh, at that point in a, in a sort of a, a scrutinizable, interrogatable database, which is what we um, uh, tried to create. Uh, with a timeline like this, which has the date and um, number of people killed, references, and a narrative of what's happened. And the narrative is really important because what we're doing is collecting as many different forms of open source information as we can get our hands on, um, predominantly media reports, but NGO reports, and um, uh, 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 government documents that we have leaked to us, government documents that leak to other people. And when you're compiling and aggregating open source intelligence, there is going to be conflict, there's going to be contradictions, and you have to be able to represent that as well as clearly as possible. Hence, four to five people killed, not just four. We don't actually know exactly how many people were killed in this strike. And it's the narrative explaining as best as we can understand what happened in this particular attack. We do manage to put this into databases, um, which you can access online um, uh, and use to your heart's desire. And it is, I mean, the coding is very, very simple. It is the number of people who have been killed, the date of the strike, and roughly speaking, the location. Um, uh, these are anchor tags to individual strikes, so you can get back to the timeline. Um, however, because of the inherent conflict and contradiction in the sources, and because of the nature of the sources, this is Reuters reporting that there was a drone strike in Miranshar. Miranshar is a large town in Pakistan. We don't actually know precisely where it is. When we came to, you know, think we should probably map these strikes, they're all happening in a part of Pakistan, they're all happening in parts of Yemen that nobody really knows. It would give good context for people to understand what they're uh, actually dealing with. When we came to decide to try and map it, essentially we ended up with um, measles on a part of the world that nobody really comprehends. And it gave us even greater problems when you start to look at somewhere like Miranshah, which is the capital of North Waziristan. There's five drone strikes on there's not. There's scores and scores. There's been, um, I can't remember how many. I mean, it's beyond my um, recollection how many drone strikes have hit Miranshah. Loads and loads and loads. They're all piling up here. This is masking the reality of what is happening in this part of the world. Furthermore, if you zoom in, zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, they're all hitting that house. Um, this is giving an illusion of, a, of specificity. Am I running out of time? Uh, yes. Right, okay, so you're giving us an illusion of specificity, which meant that um, uh, uh, people would sort of suddenly uh, believe that we had a, a greater understanding of the accuracy of these drone strikes than we actually do. We have. Uh, a lot of ambiguity in our understanding of what's happening in drone strikes. So up until we started this project, we were only really interested in who was being killed. But at this point, we decided actually we should start looking at, and we were sort of mapping, broadly speaking, where the strikes were hitting, but nobody really cared about it. Nobody went on that page on our website. And at this point, we decided we needed to look at what was being hit, target types, and where they were being hit. Because this is an attempt to place the strikes within the, um, not the, necessarily the built environment because it's quite rural, but within the living space of um, the people of the federally administered tribal areas, which is what's been isolated here. So this is where the drone strike. We did this in conjunction with forensic architecture and city research. And there's a time slider along here which can give you an idea of how frequently the drones were hitting, especially 2009, 2010. Very quickly on, on, on one final point, we decided to color code the different target types so you can have a, an, un, an understanding, a broad understanding of what kind of things are being hit. The size of the disc gives you an idea of how many people are being killed in each strike, and they're slightly opaque, so we've got around the idea of them piling up on top of one another and giving a, uh, a, a, um, an impression that there are fewer strikes than there actually are. It is, however, imperfect, um, but it is our map, and it's as best as we've been able to do thus far. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi everyone, um, thanks for the invitation. It's
some really interesting questions, everybody. Um, so this is a version of um, the map that um, I and the research group that I'm a part of has been producing. It's a slightly kind of odd version because um, it needs to be something that worked on Internet Explorer. Um, but basically, it's part of a larger research project that was looking at the impact of the crisis on public space in Athens. And um, as part of our research, this is a broader um, research project that was looking at militarization, it was looking at um, racist violence, it was looking at privatization. Um, and uh, one of the things that was kind of very clear was the rise in um, racist attacks happening throughout the city and the participation of police in those attacks. Um, so a big problem was the fact that um, even though there was a lot of media reports coming out about the, the, the issue, um, especially around racism and Golden Dawn in, in, in Greece, um, it wasn't, uh, the actual, the accurate numbers weren't coming out. And you had, so, so what our intention was basically to try and find a way um, to allow for people to anonymously report on, on racist um, attacks that were happening in the city. So we did a bunch of research and um, found the Ushahidi platform, which is a <coughs> mapping tool that allows for people to crowdsource data um, so people can report incidents anonymously. Um, and uh, then there's a certain kind of verification system that is also a kind of crowdsourcing verification system. Um, and you can set up your own categories and this kind of thing. So it seemed like a, a very good tool um, for what we were hoping to achieve. Um, yeah, there were, so there were several reasons why we decided to do a map in the end. One was the fact that we wanted to try and see if there were other ways to make sure that, um, to open up avenues for people to report on these incidents. The other thing was the fact that um, you had a bunch of NGOs that were reporting racist um, attacks but the numbers would be hidden deep in reports and wasn't very easily kind of accessible. So it was a way to try and somehow represent what was going on um, in a snapshot, make it very clearly visible, very clearly accessible, and make the data accessible for people too, so you could download the data um, as a CSV file um, if you wanted to. And then also to have it as a kind of cumulative process, so instead of kind of media reports coming out and then disappearing under the heap of new stories that come out, that there is, you know, a site that people can, you know, know they can go to and they can dig out the information down the line if they need to. Um, so, uh, what, I, I guess I wanted to really talk about what worked for us and what didn't work for us. Um, so this, this uh, hope that it was going to turn into a kind of narrative tool of giving a kind of clear snapshot of what was going on in the city worked very well and um, all of a sudden we got picked up by international media and it you know, created, yeah, had a ton, hundreds of thousands of hits, which was insane, um, crashed the servers and so on and then um, became kind of part of a kind of international pressure on uh, Greece to kind of try and reform some parts of policing and so on, which hasn't really happened. But in any case, it did kind of feed into that whole side of things. But the more participatory aspect of it um, didn't work. And um, I think there's a whole lot of reasons for that um, that has to do with, first of all, lack of resources. So um, you have a lot of kind of um, migrants associations um, in the city who are kind of recording attacks as they occur, but they don't have the time to actually go in and put in data on a platform, um, get the kind of location data correct, make sure everything is, you know, it's, it's more like notes on bits of pieces of paper in their offices. Um, so everything is done very fast, there's not the resources, not the time to go ahead and do this. So we ended up doing a lot of that work, so literally sitting down with people, having them tell us the stories and we would sit there and kind of type it up um, as we went along. So lack of resources definitely and um, and then training, you know, training people to use um, a platform like this. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about or just mention briefly in the presentation was something that came up earlier in the day, um, this question about what to map and what not to map. Um, so the fact that you can actually tell stories um, from a lot of different angles and we were thinking a lot about the potential effects of what you choose to visualize and how you choose to visualize it because this is a story around racist attacks which we've chosen to to represent um, who the victim is and where they were attacked um, but we could have gone for something and this was something we discussed very much we could have gone for you know mapping police stations and color coding police stations by how frequently they actually you know commit 
acts of, of racist violence in, in their area. So, you know, we're I'm still not sure, you know, which would have been the best option because I guess one of the kind of big question marks for me is um, I'm very concerned with what maps make people able to do or not. Yeah, what what kind of um, action, what kind of actual effect the map has, rather than just being a kind of image that gives you an immediate kind of impression, and you're like, oh, okay, now I know that a lot of racist attacks are happening in Athens. What am I going to do with that information? You know, does it make me want to do something? Does it make me able to do something, or is it just another kind of horrible fact that is actually disempowering rather than empowering? So. You know, these, these kind of questions, um, I think, are really important to think through. Um, and I, um, I don't think we've resolved them fully, but, yeah, it was something I wanted to raise. Um, so we have time for about um, ten minutes for questions. So I thought we might, if people had questions, we might collect them. And then if all of the speakers could come up, you can respond to them. Um, so if you have specific questions about the maps or the techniques or whatever, the themes, um, who's going to be the first? I think it's just a turn the first one. That was the idea. I would like to think a little bit more about my question. Um, my first question is, in terms of some of the categories that you're forced to employ, so for you, civilian militant, or uh, is it a mass gas attack, a tear gas attack, or not, and, or is it a racist attack or not? Like, could you speak a little bit about how you address those limits? <coughs> um, and my second question is um, uh, in terms of. Any other, I think those are great questions. We'll just take another one and then have people answer. Um, so I was really curious, and Jack um, said the map, the, the map that we made isn't perfect. I'd like to know more a little bit about your reflections on the challenges of the map that they made. And I guess for all of you three, um, reflecting on what makes a map empowering. Um, especially maps that are online, considering it's online. So, yeah, why don't we, if you'd like to respond to those questions. Um, the term militant and civilian, which are often used to describe people who are killed by drone strikes, as far as I'm aware, don't actually have a basis in international law. Combatant and non-combatant are the terms which have basis in international law. Militant and civilian are being used as sort of catch-alls by the media to describe who are being killed in drone strikes. Um, some people are reportedly civilians. Most people are described as anonymously, unnamed, just militants. Um, it's challenging for us to determine who falls into which category because we're not there. We are doing the reporting ourselves. And we aren't speaking to um, gathering testimony of, of witnesses or relatives or that sort of thing who can give us a very clear determination of what ascribes somebody non-combatant status, especially in an area where there isn't actually an, an active armed conflict, or at least a lot of people would argue there isn't an active armed conflict. Some people do. Um, it's fine when people are reported as being a civilian because they are clearly described as being a civilian. It's more difficult when they're reported to be a militant because that could mean pretty much anything, including a guy with a beard and a gun, which in the for tribal areas of Pakistan describes a lot of people who have nothing to do with any kind of armed conflict. So we describe, we determine civilians and others as our categories, and we don't really try to start to draw too many conclusions on what is a militant and what is not a militant. It's a, it's a very fluid and broad area. Um, the flaws are essentially to do with 
um, specificity. So we don't really know to a coordinate, a G GPS coordinate, where the strikes are hitting. We only know as much as is reported. Um, therefore, these maps can give a very false impression of um, our uh, the accuracy of our understanding of what is being hit. The inaccuracy of our casualty estimates, whilst I believe they, that broadly speaking they are quite accurate, 2,500 to 3,500 people killed, 400 to 900 civilians, I think those, those ranges are accurate, but it's still a huge range, uh, and so that there is also mapping that vagueness and that conflict is quite complicated on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a concept, on a structure, which is by very definition specific, um, and so there's a, there's a conflict there. Um, I, it would be great to get some bottom-up testimony of what, what's happening to people in the tribal areas, but it's just so difficult to get there to talk to people that it's not really possible in every instance. I think when it comes to accuracy, um, it's a similar thing for us, and it relates to your question about um, what's a racist attack and what's not a racist attack, where we know that we're very likely to have not even the tip of the iceberg in terms of amounts of data. So we did, took the decision to lean towards including something even if there's a question mark of whether or not it's actually a racist attack, um, which is kind of dubious, but we make that very clear on the website. Um, and there is a kind of verification level that you can set, which is also a kind of crowdsourced element and hasn't actually been used that much by people that have been looking at the map, unfortunately, but that was the intention. Um, and then apart from that, I wasn't quite sure if your category only your category question only relates to that, or also kind of in general to other categories of the types of attacks, but we also tried to expand on whether it's like someone being verbally abused on the, on the bus, or a very severe physical attack, or someone being killed or tortured, so there is like color codes for um, the different types of attacks as well. Um, there are testimonies, uh, something I didn't show either, but you can click on the red dots and then you'll get um, a full description of um, well, basically the information that we were able to get. And some of the migrants associations in Greece have been you know, very, very consistent with getting kind of full testimonies from people. Um, and other times it's just we only have a couple lines and that's all the information we got. Um, in terms of what makes a map effective or not, related to this kind of bottom-up question, we were hoping, I mean, I, I was all, have always been a bit worried about our map that it's disempowering in the sense that it presents a kind of image of violence and there's not much you can do about it. And, but the hope and the idea was that because it's a crowdsourced tool that you can actually take up and use as a kind of organizer or as a kind of group, that there would be that kind of way of dealing with the issue as well so that it could become a kind of a tool as part of a kind of broader process of organizing around the issue. Um, and uh, yeah, and then the other element of having, I think, I think memory and and making something visible is also quite important as part of an empowering process. So the fact that uh, I mean, this is something we were talking about earlier too: what information to include, what information not to include in these kinds of maps. Where there's been some questions of whether you put the full identity of the victim up or not, and in some cases, um, the the you know putting up the first name and the second name of a person, kind of, of someone who's been killed can be a very strong statement. It'd be like, this person is a real person, they have a history, they have a family, they, you know, they existed and that, and that person got killed. Is, you know, that's an important statement to make, but to make that person a person, not just a number. Um, other times, it's better to keep it anonymous because, you know, the, it, the tension in the area um, just means that it's going to put a lot of other people at risk or, you know, these kinds of things. So, and that's been something that we've, we've had to rely on um, the, the kind of sources to determine, you know, what, what is the best way to go for that. Um, but yeah, so I think there's like empowering elements of the way we went around about this mapping process, but other things that are, that are kind of remain open question marks for me about whether it was the most effective way. Yeah, yeah so I'll echo something Jack said and I'll echo something Jack said, but. Um, so in, in terms of the question of, of indexing, so and, and inter this is also an international law issue, so tear gas itself is like not either a trade category or a proper category <coughs> in all kinds of UN and various international laws, which make it incredibly difficult to track. And that is part accidental and part right, a political 
uh, the political reasons for that. And so the very act of even naming tear gas and trying to chart it as tear gas creates that category in, in, in a certain way. Um, and so I just think there's also this, this thing that mapping, whether it's actually physically mapping like this or mapping in the more broader sense that we use it, of, of any kind of object or action, like a drone strike, like what we call racist violence, like tear gas, um, creates a knowability and a visibility of, of that thing. So I think there's something really important that tactically is always happening, but also really problematic that, that is always coming every time that we do that. Um, so then the decision to, dis to, to differentiate is largely, has to do with some really geeky things like um, toxicity and how different kinds of tear gas actually work. And in some it has to do with scoping. So like how many things can I actually be tracking at once as one human? Um, and then it also has to do um, with, with, there's something about the mass, and I don't know if you've like, like there's something about an individual a attack that is so personal and, and I guess I kind of put an ethical, like I also map, track that, but I haven't mapped that because I'm facing all of the questions that Jaya raised about how you do that in a way, you know, am I gonna seek consent from family members of all these people? Am I not? Am I gonna say that, well, it's, in the, it's public, it's in the IPCC, I'm using IPCC um, and news reports. Uh, you know, am I gonna say that because it's public, well, I'm allowed to? And I haven't kind of worked out how, how I feel about, about those things. And I think it raises that a bigger question, which is what is the larger relationship in any movement context of the relationship between the incident, the testimony, and the target. Um, so we currently, I map incidences, I map targets, and I map um, testimony, but I do them in different ways. And I think I haven't brought them together because I don't know how. Um, and we talked a little bit today also about the complexity of creating multi-layered maps, which I think will come up in the next session, so maybe I'll leave it there um, for those guys to talk about that. Excuse my voice for a second. Um, so this is just getting set up for our second round, which is on participatory mapping. Um, we've got um, a series of maps about sort of like local um, and um, national uh, mapping projects that are drawn, you know, partly from sort of crowdsourced information. Um, so first to talk on this, we have uh, from, sorry, okay, it's wrong. Um, Nate Eisenstein, um, yeah, from Know Your Bristol, uh, which is an ARJ, AHRC project. So Thanks a lot. Um, okay, yeah, so I'm going to talk about this project. Thanks to the presenters uh, before me. That was really, really interesting. Um, so, yeah, now you're Bristol on the move. Uh, it's an AHRC project, um, as has been said. But basically, the premise of this project um, is that maps, mapping, archives, and archiving um, have produced and legitimised dominant accounts of the world and in so doing, reproduce and legitimise the status quo. And so the aim of this project has been to facilitate the co-production of alternative accounts of the city, alternative accounts of Bristol, um, its history, heritage and culture, um, and in so doing, to open alternative routes for the present. So working with local community groups, we've been recording, collecting, archiving and digitising um, objects, stories, images, um, doing this at public events through one-to-one -one collaborations um, and smaller workshops. And to do this, we've been using, and we've been mapping them, believe it or not, and uh, we've been using two, two mapping tools. So the first is called Know Your Place. Forgive the title. Um, it was developed by Bristol City Council 
as a visual representation of the historic environment record, which is what planners refer to when they're making planning decisions. So it wasn't initially designed as something that would be public facing. So you've got these various things that tell you about uh, land use in a particular area. So some bright spark at the, uh, the city council thought this could be a really interesting community engagement tool. Um, so working with Bristol City Council, we worked on this community layer and oral history layer, um, which facilitated some degree of crowdsourced content. So I'm not using the actual map because it, chances are the server will die when I try and present it, so that generally always happens. So you've got your map of Bristol, you can zoom in on a point, so let's click on a point. You've got various assets that have been uploaded, you know, objects that have been uploaded. So photo here of um, the Bristol headquarters of the Women's Suffrage Society um, in 1913, which had been destroyed by Bristol students. When I first saw this, photo, I, I thought, oh wow, it's, it's uh, you know, students in support of the suffragettes have done some property <laughs> destruction. No, this is, the suffragettes office was destroyed by Bristol students, allegedly in response to the suffragettes burning um, Bristol uh, cricket pavilion uh, <laughs> <laughs> some weeks before due to uh, sexism within uh, Bristol University. So interesting, uh, an, an interesting image of the reactionary character of the student body at that time in that place. Um, cool thing about Know Your Place is you've got all these historic maps. So if we click on uh, the 1900s epoch, see the little square, we can go to uh, the 1900s map, we can see these other maps, we can zoom into quite a high resolution. These are maps that are held by Bristol Records Office, the local archive, um, and these have all been uh, overlaid, geolocated, or geopositioned and overlaid or underlaid. Um, and when working with school groups, people tend to love this aspect of Know Your Place, that you can really see how the city has transformed over time. And it's great when you're looking, trying to locate places where the buildings no longer exist. So it's a fun, it's a fun tool, but it's pretty clunky. It's hierarchically moderated, so it's moderated by someone at the council because it's an official record, it's the historic environment record. Um, so it's not massively conducive to pulling in crowdsourced content. So for that reason, we developed this site, Map Your Bristol, which is basically, is, it's kind of a pared down, more user-friendly version. Um, and this is where we've got the like not eight or nine different community groups that we've been working with through the course of the current project. So we still have the ability to view some of the historic maps, um, but this is not, uh, this is community moderated. So I'll just jump in and show you the anti-apartheid layer. So we're working with a group who are active in struggles against apartheid in Bristol and who wanted to um, archive and map their history. So, yeah, there's an example here, Shell Petrol Station, Hampton Road, um, was a site of regular pickets. So we can, we can zoom in on that. And then you jump through to, the click on, you click read more, you jump through to a page and there's various things so they can upload high res, digitized images, posters um, from their struggles. So that's, we could, you know, I've got minimal time. Yeah. What am I on? One minute. Oh, I've got one minute, so yeah. Um, there's loads more to say about working with various different groups. Um, I've kind of talked about some of the differences between the two maps. I guess mapping for justice. Um, this isn't about uh, articulating a political or economic claim. It's not about exposing injustice per se. But it is about co-producing and valorizing subjugated or less valued knowledges. Um, and rendering alternative views of the city visible and therefore viable. And there's something in the connections and conversations that have taken place through this project with others about the trust that has been built between community groups and the university 
and the projects that kind of ripple out from those connections. So, yeah, I think it's oriented to justice in some unusual ways. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, so next up we've got um, Justin Bainry, who's, is that right? Yes. Yeah, who's giving us um, a bit of a sneak peek of a project that's sort of been in the pipeline and will be sort of formally launched quite soon. Um, he's from Leeds Beckett University and Historic England, and it's the LGBTQ map in Bungie. Yes, thank you so much, and thank you for, uh, for having me here. Uh, the project that I'm working on is, uh, map, it's the trial phase. Um, of a national project that will be launched um, within the next month or so, fingers crossed. Um, right now it's in trial phase, just looking at London, in which we were experimenting with, with the mapping, with the crowdsourcing, and with a lot of the issues that we've been um, all discussing here today. Um, this project with Historic England, formerly a part of English Heritage, they, there's been a, a break in the, uh, um, in the structure, so there's a new organization that, um, that we're involved with and that commissioned um, this project. Um, it comes on the heels of several other um, historical projects that uh, Historical England has been looking at into underrepresented heritages. Um, so it comes from, uh, initially there was uh, projects on women's history, on disabilities history, and histories of slavery in England. And so this one is the LGBTQ uh, history project. Um, and it is the, um, the first time that Historical England has um, um, looked into mapping and crowdsourcing uh, crowdsourcing information from the public. It's also the largest of these underrepresented heritage projects that they've uh, that they've taken on. So the biggest part of it is then this crowdsourcing element. I'll just scroll down. And this is the uh, the trial map that we have available right now. We've done it in such a way that the um, the public can access it anonymously. Um, we're trying to get as wide of participation as possible, um, really to define differently what history and heritage could be. So we're very conscious of not being um, the the experts from officialdom saying this is what capital H history is, but we're looking to be told by heritage groups, LGBTQ groups, um, and others what constitutes viable and valid and important and interesting um, histories from, in this case, across London, but um, in the future across England. Um, so this can include, well, anything. Um, I'm, I'm moderating it, so I haven't rejected anything yet. Um, and uh, it's hard to imagine much that would be in any way historical that, that I would moderate out. So I've just been there really keeping an eye to make sure there's nothing offensive, nothing, no spam, nothing like that. Um, but it's interesting because I'm, I'm quite glad that so far, of the sort of hundred and some odd um, locations that have been mapped on London, people have felt quite free to include um, all range of types of historical locations. Um, they haven't been um, dissuaded by the sort of academic credentials and Historic England credentials to put in the sort of worthy buildings of our past, but we've got um, several. You can see here, for instance, um, we've got an uh, instance of just drinking clubs and bars places that might still be in operation, others that might be gone now. That's the other thing. We're looking both at locations that are extant um, and potentially even ongoing because they designate a sort of historical significance to a contemporary community, but we're also looking to map places that no longer exist, um, that have been destroyed through development, that have just been destroyed through time, through the changes of the city. Um, our mapping right now is predominantly uh, recent, recent, uh, recent memory, living memory, uh, but we have history going back, well, we've, we've set our goals going all the way back to the Roman period. We're just opening it wide up. And in this current map, we have, uh, I think the oldest one on here now is an entry for Cheapside, um, which is the case of an individual, Eleanor John, Reich, Eleanor slash John Reichener, um, a gender-crossing individual who was picked up, um, I believe, uh, and accused for pro uh, of prostitution. Um, on Cheapside in 1395. Um, so this is a, a case that's um, uh, recorded in the London Metropolitan Archives and we've identified Cheapside um, as the location in London of significance because of this story. So it's, again, even though it's historic, uh, uh, historic England that's doing this, and they're obviously very interested in very specific, discrete buildings, issues of designation and listing and uh, histories associated with currently listed buildings, we're also identifying the history in more generalized locations. So not necessarily attached to a single building, but often attached to a generalized location. And going back to what I was saying before as well, about the, 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 the broad range of material that we're, that we're, that we're interested in 
um, in accessing and having, um, having discussed through this project. Um, we're also getting uh, things like, where's a good example here? Um, well, Cleveland Street is a building. Uh, there's a building that was a building there, but we're looking at <coughs> incidents of, uh, of, we have someone that's been going through um, and identifying locations of sexual encounters um, that he had in the 60s and 70s, cruising areas that would have been known to, uh, to gay men in that period. And so those are being designated on this list as well. Uh, we've been joking amongst ourselves that we want to list, uh, we want to list one of the toilets um, in central London because it, it comes up so often in reminiscences uh, from, a, from a certain period, but also is really important to the, um, the sort of shared historical memory of a, of a group of LGBTQ people. Um, and therefore, by our, by our, by our uh, designation, merits representation um, on the map. But it also brings up other questions that come up in our um, mapping. So when you go to uh, submit a location, we've tried to keep it as simple as possible to, uh, well, to keep it as accessible as possible. Place name, location, description. But under category then, this has been a question that's been coming up as well. We've got some general categories, but what happens if you have a club that's raided by the police and they discover two men having sex in the back? Is that going to be crime in the law? Is that going to be sex and intimacy? Is that going to be pubs, clubs, and social spaces? We don't have the, 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 the ability on this map right now to multiply categorize places, which is one of the reasons why this is a trial and this map is going to be transforming in the next month or so to allow for keywording, allow for tagging, and allow for multiple categorization because we found that that's just so important to being able to, uh, to, to indicate the complicated nature of LGBTQ histories. Thank you very much. And so finally, for the Francisco Tree Mapping, we've got um, Steve McFarland, who's flown all the way from New York. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> um, he's going to present the Adjunct Map, uh, which is part of the Cooney Adjunct Project, which is now at the University of Tampa. Or is that the, uh, uh, a little, little complicated. Yeah. yeah, so hopefully we can unravel that. Yeah. Thing, but yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, this uh, map I'm going to show was uh, done by a, a sort of informal collective that came together out of a reading group on precarious labor that was at the uh, former Breck Forum. Uh, radical social and educational space in New York City. Um, and people were doing some readings about uh, precarity and thinking about how this sort of uh, trend could be made visible. And um, a few of us worked in the academy or had recently come out of graduate school and um, decided that uh, uh, adjunct labor, precarious labor uh, in colleges and universities in the US would be uh, a good place to start, to start mapping some of this. We knew that there was data available uh, which had been gathered the year before by a guy named Josh Bolt who had been um, an adjunct at a, a university in Georgia. He um, one day decided to put out a call for, you know, find out about conditions, kind of militant research, finding out about conditions uh, around the U.S. in terms of how much people were making, being paid for class, whether or not they were in a union, um, what sorts of uh, benefits um, and uh, you know, guarantees of job security they were offered. Um, and that was something that when, when we saw, you know, hundreds, I think, I think about 1,100 people were responded to his one, that was all gathered in a, in a uh, Google spreadsheet. You know, those of us who were active in, in adjunct rights organizing at the time were, you know, really amazed and, you know, seeing all this information come in from around the country. Um, and we decided that it would be great to, to map this data. Um, so we set up um, using the, the Cardo DB program. Um, uh, a map, and we, we were able to geolocate these uh, colleges by sort of uh, matching them by name with a larger database that the U.S. Department of Education keeps of all higher education institutions. So about 1,100 of them matched up. Um, we color-coded uh, by the, the pay per class. Um, so the standard teaching load for an academic in the U.S. tends to be about three classes per semester, two semesters during the year. Um, and, uh, you know, this adjunct pay ranged anywhere from, uh, the, you know, uh, 1700 at, at the low end up to 11500 at the high end, tended to be around $3,000. Um, so, you know, uh, many adjuncts could be working the equivalent of a full-time job that, that a tenured faculty member would be making um, and be making near, near poverty level, near minimum wage uh, for the year, uh, assuming six classes in the year. Uh, so once these are located and, and color coded, then we uh, also associated them um, with some other information. Um, in the Department of Ed database, there was uh, info on the, the average salary for a full timer, so we could compare um, how many classes an adjunct would have to teach 
uh, a year to earn the equivalent of a full-time salary. And in many institutions, it was a, you know, a ridiculous figure for those of us who know how much work it takes to teach one class, 24 classes, in some cases 90 classes an adjunct would have to teach to uh, earn parity in terms of pay. Um, then we were also able to get uh, from, from the Department of Ed uh, figures uh, the tuition per class. So we could see, well, you know, in a given classroom, if I was standing before all of you as, as my students, um, you know, how many of you were essentially paying tuition that would cover the equivalent of my salary for, the, for an adjunct? So in many, many cases, it was just a handful of students in, in a room, uh, and their tuition would be covering the, the uh, pay of the instructor, and the rest, of course, going to, um, you know, administration, overhead, uh, you know, building, servicing debt on buildings, and, and so on. Um, so the idea of the, of the map was to kind of uh, reveal inequalities within the, the system of, you know, some people earning a generous living with uh, substantial benefits and job security, and others just kind of scraping by as adjuncts. Um, and to also reveal, you know, start to call into question uh, with all these runaway uh, tuitions uh, in the U.S., tuition rising up, uh, you know, in the double digits uh, every year for a long, for a long stretch. Um, you know, where is all this money going to get, get people to call into question uh, some of these patterns in the U.S.? Uh, and we also, you know, thought it was good to uh, <clears throat> do something that a spreadsheet couldn't do, which is to say, you know, you could find your university and see, you know, who else is around. What, what, are people working under similar conditions as you? Do they have benefits? Uh, don't they? Uh, how can we begin to you know, organize across campuses so that the academic uh, labor can be a very atomizing, uh, alienating uh, sort of situation, whereas an adjunct you may be coming in at different times with your, your coworkers. Uh, you may not be in communication with others on, on different campuses. Uh, so we envision the map as a sort of way of getting people thinking about the connections from one campus to another uh, and one department to another within a so that's about all I'll say. Next. All right. So similarly, we sort of had a good time. We'll have about sort of five, ten minutes for um, a couple of questions, um, sort of specific to this. But then we'll, there will be time at the end um, for sort of more wide-ranging questions. So, there you go, sorry, so has anyone got anything? A basic question. If the idea of mapping is about data visualization, is mapping actually any good in terms of a variety of ways of doing that? And I saw a list of all these maps, and all the maps before, like that, they're like literally old fashioned maps with dots on them. You think, as we sort of talked about this session and before, that's hugely limiting. A lot of the stuff is all in one place, or how do you make differentiations and stuff? And even on a basic level, like basic visualization, like changing the size of countries and putting the number of deaths in custody or something, to me, well, maybe that's not mapping, but it seems to me that literal mapping, um, out of the wide range of possible ways of visualizing things to think about justice, empowerment, politics, engagement, participation, why are we doing it in this literal way? Hold on, I was going to ask one of them. I was just wondering if there's any reason to rely on um, getting wide sort of public Well, in terms of the utility of the um, of the map, um, our goal, I think, for the um, uh, for the LGBTQ map is is twofold. It's one, it's engaging people in history in a context in which they can can engage, um, in which they find engaging. So, putting it back to places of experience um, is one way of doing that. But it's also one of recording history um, and uh, making that available to the public. So, there's so much remarkable history that's that's in living memory but also locked in secondary sources, collected collected collections that are deposited all over the country that remain inaccessible to a large number of people that aren't professional scholars and historians. Um, so part of this, I spoke specifically here about the crowdsourcing element of individuals 
uh, uh, submitting locations, but we also want to have um, scholars, academics, volunteers mining through academic research and existing oral history collections, finding available information that hasn't that's that's available ostensibly, but not in practice to a large number uh, of people. Um, in terms of visualization, one of the things that we're looking into, other maps have certainly done very effectively, is showing uh, with bars changing over time. So in terms of the locations of LGBTQ history, um, we would see even just in London that Soho and Compton Street are the, the sort of the, the, the idea that these have gone on and on and on is really a myth, and that there's other places around the city that have in fact had longer histories of, um, of LGBTQ experience um, across London. Um, and for um, crowdsourcing and where the information is coming from, for us, it really is about accessing community groups, heritage groups, and getting the widest possible dispersal out there. We're looking into sponsoring workshops, so-called pinning parties, and bringing pe together people to, uh, to discuss that. But um, this is something that came up in the workshops that uh, there's really great methods out there as well. Yeah, I mean, I think let's compare the maps that I presented to an archive. Now, we're working with a lot of community groups who've done a lot of archiving and digitization work. That's great. You can go to Bristol Records Office and you can sift through and you can request documents and you can find this stuff. It's really <coughs> difficult and not many people will do it. These maps get tons of hits. I don't have the exact uh, figures. They get a lot more hits. The people that we speak to really like accessing data in this way. They don't show everything, and I think yeah, we need to be really upfront about what they don't show, what they miss, the way the tendency that they can have to collapse different histories. Um, but they do show something that people seem to like, and it's certainly a lot easier to access than traditional archives. So I think. I think they do have their use. In terms of how do we get people to contribute, it's a huge amount is trust. And just putting just putting the map out there isn't enough. You know, like the the internet is apps, you know, there's so much on the internet already, how are you gonna get people to look at your stuff? For us it's having the one on one connection with the community group who we're working with. And what we found <coughs> is that when that group shares a pre-existing set of assumptions around what is history, what is an archive, why is it valuable to archive your history, why map, then it's really easy to elicit contributions. When those pre-existing assumptions aren't shared, and that generally happens when working across difference, then other work is needed before you can get that content. More trust building, more um, conversations around what the categories should be, around what should go up, around rights and privacy. So it's all that kind of foregrounding work has to be done. I think it's also true that the, you know this GIS technology kind of emerges out of the command and control, technical, rational, uh, you know, kind of information infrastructure, so it makes it easy to do the kinds of things that are like putting a whole bunch of points up on a map. On a map. It makes it a lot harder to do the kinds of qualitative editions of stories, images, sounds, and so on, but not impossible. I mean, our, our group talked about doing other things supplementary to this map, gathering adjuncts, mental maps of what, you know, what a week or a year, uh, you know, what are significant places for someone who teaches at four or five different institutions. Um, or you know, following someone around as a sort of transect, you know, through their lives as they, they cross the city from one place to another. Um, so I think there's you know opportunities to, to merge both sort of more quantitative and qualitative, but it's more difficult to take some. Okay, we'll wrap it up there and um, run for applause for our speakers. Um, Okay, um, we have one more panel and then uh, we're just going to open it up to a general um, discussion session. The last panel is on um, 
mapping London's housing struggles. I'm sure you've all noted the irony that we're standing in sort of ground zero for financial speculation in real estate in the United Kingdom. But um, oh, um, let's see what we can sort of make of that. Um, I'll let the speakers introduce themselves and their affiliation, however they like. I'm up at my computer first. Because we really have five minutes, I'm going to do this with you. Oh, your tabs are open already. I couldn't find mine. Oh. student in architecture in fourth year, meaning I'm uh, graduating ne next year and will be an architect working in London in the context we know. And I think it's fair to say that today in London, um, we are in a permanent state of crisis in terms of housing. Uh, as far as we know, London is owned by a disconnected interest, uh, which are creating holes in the city fabrics and divisions among its users, so among us. Um, so because I was involved with uh, different um, campaigners and residents in East London, uh, I actually started to realize how many things were going on. And I also realized I didn't know anything. So um, I started to actually gather data from council websites uh, related to um, how many uh, social housing estates were going through uh, regeneration uh, in their uh, in their uh, area, and actually, uh, what I started to uncover was quite a crazy numbers. Um, okay, so if it doesn't want to load, it's here. Uh, which is the first map I started to make, which is actually um, showing that there is more than 80 uh, social housing estates. Uh, that are uh, being uh, going through regeneration at the moment. It's there. Yes. Yeah. But it's also uh, the great thing is that it's um, an object that you can have in your pocket that you can use when you go to see your consular because you get your eviction notice. Because in there you know exactly um, how many square meters in your uh, social housing estate they are actually demolishing and um, what the value of the land is and who are uh, the people involved in terms of uh, change of ownership uh, or things. So actually I have two objects, one is online, uh, which can be, uh, which is made on an open source software that you can actually uh, modify and put into a data. Okay, yes. Um, so each time you click on each estate and you have exactly uh, how many residents are affected, uh, how, what's the numbers of square meters, the value of the land, and uh, so I chose the carpenter's estate in purpose here because uh, they actually don't have a plan of what's going to happen next. Uh, but usually you also have the name of the developers and what's, um, what's coming next uh, for you. So it has actually been used uh, quite widely among uh, residents and campaigners in East London mostly. And then the second map I made is this one, which is a sort of a visualizing uh, what's really going on and trying to talk a bit more uh, on a wider scale about um, ownership and who are really the actors of the London of tomorrow. And what I actually map on this one goes up to 2032. So it's actually what will be London, uh, what is, for how long are we going to be able to stay? in London, and uh, what is our future? A future of glass and empty city. Uh, who is going to be... Uh, so yeah, basically, that's why I made it, because 
as an architect, I'm wondering what, what is home today and what is going to happen and what did I want to say more? Uh, yeah. yeah, that's it. <laughs> by the London Tenants Federation uh, that kind of highlights within Greater London all the areas that are designated by the London Plan as either opportunity areas or intensification areas. And usually these are areas where development is supposed to take. So the state um, that I was kind of studying but also involved in kind of mapping, I suppose, in the last few years was the Haygate Estate. Uh, you can't really see it from this map, but it's kind of in the north of Southwark, which is an inner uh, London borough, and it's exactly in one of the lar largest parts in the Elephant and Castle Opportunity Area, which was the regeneration area. Um, this is what the estate looked like. Um, it was kind of high-rise blocks, mesonets, quite a few trees, um, and these are just some some figures to give a sense of it. wasn't a huge, huge estate, but it was largish. Uh, it was mostly council owned with a, um, about nearly 200 leaseholders. And the, the process of displacement, and someone was saying earlier, I should have, it would be nice to map it actually across time. We haven't done it yet, but it's, um, it took nearly seven years, um, well, more than seven years actually, for all the residents to be decanted. And so, what you might know this estate as an empty space precisely because at some point the decision was taken and little by little people were um, you know, kind of asked to leave. Some of them were being rehoused um, into council properties, some of them had to move to other sorts of accommodations, social rented into housing association, uh, private rented. And I think you can probably see we began really being active around 2009, so when basically the state was completely empty, but for a few tenants and the leaseholders. Um, and so, and this is just kind of some of um, 
the organizing we were doing around the area was, for instance, uh, mapping all the different developments, having gentrification walks into the estate. Um, the archive is linked to a popular blog called the Southern Notes. And building on this, um, we also started a collaboration as part of an anti Foundation project with the London Tenants Federation, Just Space, which is a kind of a planning justice uh, network in London. Uh, and Professor Lurette Denise. And what we were really finding hard in this research around displacement was, kind of in a sense, um, it was really about trying to find the hard evidence that is the, the quantitative data that you could actually quote back and sort of mention. For instance, in a, in a situation of a public inquiry as we were engaged in with the last leaseholders. Um, and also using the language of displacement rather than the language of rehousing or voluntary relocation to show that the vast majority of residents were not moving out of their own accord, they were being forced to move. Um, and what is proposed to be built, what is being built is majority market rented housing, three times the density, etc. Um, there were a lot of I suppose artists but also documentary filmmakers who were and journalists who were in a sense mapping the human story behind this but we felt that was so anecdotal and it was very easy for the council to turn back and say you're only talking to three people and of course and these are the people who have had a bad you know uh, I don't know a bad experience with the relocation process and no we wanted to show that actually uh, this was something that was affecting people on a grand scale and it was happening elsewhere as well so the problem was data. And the way we got data was through, part of it through freedom of information requests to the local authority. And so we got the partial destination postcodes. Uh, so kind of the first half of the postcode of secure council tenants, because this is data that local authorities have to have, because when the, they have the responsibility for uh, rehousing them. Um, during the involvement in the public inquiry into the compulsory purchase order, we managed to get um, the full postcode destination of the 179 displaced leaseholders, which is a different kind of data that was not publicly available at that point. And I would point out that um, what is missing is the data of about 300 households uh, that at that point, kind of post-2001, post the decision of demolishing the estate, um, had been housed in the estate in the council properties, but somehow were not accounted for. So we're thinking about a third of the state in living there maybe for 10 years who were basically not registered really as residents in their, in their data. So again, it's interesting in terms of what you can show, uh, what, what you have access to and what is just not registered. Anyway, so these are two maps you probably, I suppose some of you must have seen them. Um, we just kind of put the data in Google map and made something a very simple in a sense map of how this displacement took place. Um, I suppose so that the tenant's map is very much, is still based in London. The um, leaseholder uh, displacement map is actually reaching beyond Greater London. Um, once we produced this, we came across the fact that we couldn't really print them or publish them or do with them what we wanted um, because it's proprietary uh, data, it's, it's Google. So we then made some maps which are uh, then published in this booklet as part of the research we were doing. Um, and these are produced actually through uh, open source GIS. Uh, the data has been downloaded, we've used open layers, etc., etc. So we can, and then we've kind of manipulated them uh, through different um, other softwares like Illustrator and Design. And in a sense, I don't know, for instance, I don't know if this is a successful visualization, but we were trying to get a sense of actually how far leaseholders who were supposed to be, in a sense, um, you know, perhaps not the, the, the immediate, uh, what we would immediately recognize as the victims of displacement, actually had to go, precisely because of this differential relationship with the council and the fact that uh, in this case they would be given compensation that was way below market price and some of them had to move uh, 30 kilometers away from where they grew up their whole life. We're talking about people who might have bought a house quite early in their life and, um, and lived there their whole life, pretty much. And in terms of distribution, um, these maps were included in this booklet, which was basically one of the outputs of this joint piece of research, uh, of activist scholar research, 
um, this is um, and it was kind of like a case study um, for um, for a booklet that we have been distributing around that um, includes whole sort of information about what is actually happening to council estates in London, um, what, what way the ways in which different uh, groups in estates have been organising, and. Um, and it's a booklet that we've printed and we've been distributing through community events, but also it's available online for download. And I think that's pretty much it. Um, I, the, the map has been shared really widely. I, I don't, can't really give you a figure of this, but I think it re there was really a moment uh, within organizing a couple of years ago where this map suddenly kind of popped up and it became like a very clear visualization of the scale. Of this, and now there are more maps being produced, for instance, around the Amesbury estate uh, regeneration plans, and they've been picked up by journalists, they printed, etc. So they travel, which is good. Thing. <laughs> um, so, it, 
The other idea that complements this map is, you see it on the back, it's bits of interviews. We went to talk to all the traders and asked them two questions about, uh, about their, their shops and about Brixton. Uh, I mean about gentrification and about Brixton and they came up with these answers. And we were absolutely, I don't know, struck by how incredibly emotional these answers to some very simple questions turned out to be. I mean, if you look at the big quotes that we printed in big typefaces on the back, um, the one thing that I find amazing is actually the one, <coughs> survive the riots, and it's not the fire that kills you, it's the developers from Bricks and Cycles. But there are things like, do they want to turn me into a beggar? So it's a very, it's, a, it's almost like an emotional, a, a, a map of, a, a map of the narrative of, of the emotional state at a time of urban renewal. So we just printed that on the back and folded it nicely and um, distributed it. We gave it uh, to the traders themselves. And then on the, I think it was on the 25th of April, there was a big event in Brixton, we claimed Brixton, a protest event. And that was actually our deadline for that, we made it. And we distributed about a, a thousand copies of it. People really liked it. And people used this thing, I mean, talking about distribution of maps. People didn't just use it as an object or as a map, they also used it like this, you know, during the demonstration, um, as a a symbol for we're not allowed to speak or the broken heart goes for the mouth. So it became a prop to make the, the Reclaim Brixton event more visual and more expressive. And um, yeah, we've been asked, uh, we've been asked by the traders to produce more of them because their customers are asking for them. So we're probably going to do it. And I mean, I don't know about everybody, but I'm still surprised how much resonance this very simple map has found. Thank you. Um, so we're going to open up to questions specifically about a few of our cartographers. Um, so we'll open up to specific questions about these presentations, and then um, more broadly um, for a broader, sorry, uh, a broader discussion. But um, let's that these are 
failing crumbling infrastructures. Um, and in fact, a lot of campaign groups are really seriously trying to produce evidence of, of the possibility of refurbishment, for instance. And clearly, the problem there is not what is on top of the land, but it's the value of the land. Um, and these are decisions that are taken basically without any real appraisal of whether, you know, um, it is actually a crumbling infrastructure, it's not fulfilling. Um, the needs. And I would also add the fact that council estates tend to be built to a better standard than a lot of what is shoddily put together right now with much higher density and much less services at the moment. So what is replacing is actually low, of lower quality. So I think, you know, in that sense, uh, refurbishment of this social housing uh, is definitely an option that is just not considered because that's not the, the ideology. Yeah, I would just add that uh, lack of imagination, basically, uh, because there are lots of um, alternatives uh, that are explored in other countries, but at the moment not in London in particular. And I would say speed of speculation and the speed at which it goes uh, at the moment uh, doesn't allow for public debate. Mm -hmm. And so I think the notion of slowing down and making visible uh, what are the real actors behind you having to leave your house uh, are, I think, is, should be much more part uh, of the public debate. Because what I forgot to say in the presentation is that actually, um, at the moment while I'm talking, there is more than 200,000 residents affected, which means evicted. Uh, there is more than 20 kilometers squares of land changing ownership. So it's an historical moment in London at the moment, which is, I guess you could compare to 1946-48, but in the reverse. Uh, and uh, the value of the land, when you sort of add up all these uh, things I have on the map, uh, is uh, more than 52 billion. So I guess that gives you an idea of what these very few little players, uh, Amazon, Fund Housing Group, Wig, Stone Life Investment, are doing and for architects at the moment it's a completely frustrating, uh, very frustrating situation because they are the one employing us and do I really build to the standard they ask for which are absolutely really shitty. Um, about the resources, um, <laughs> it's very interesting because we are a group where most of us are either working or students but have really busy lives so time is very scarce and the other thing that scarce is space it's really hard for us to find a space in Brixton where 8 12 people can meet it's really hard we've met in the back room of one of the little cafes that is going to be um, evicted probably which was about I don't know maybe eight square meters and we sat on boxes and crates and things um, so it's, it's, it's not ideal and um, somehow we haven't really managed to, uh, to connect, for instance, with, uh, I don't know, Bricks and Black Cultural Archives or any of the institutions. The institution that we used to use was a pub that has closed down because it didn't like to be gentrified. So it's, kind of, it's a real struggle. I mean, in a way, the process of getting together and organizing is actually part of the very struggle we are trying to be part of. And the money, I mean, this a thousand copies of, of a map that costs 88 pounds and we chip in. And if we need more money, we'll probably end up doing a benefit if nobody gets around to apply for proper money, which is research funded. But, you know, it's necessity. Things just happen on a shoestring out of necessity. I mean, in our case, the research money was mainly for printing. Um, and all the research that went in was just people organizing uh, around the estate, people, leaseholders on the estate, trying to put together data that they could use in their own court cases. You know, so in that sense, a lot of the data was also produced as part of the process. And then we decided that we actually wanted to print some of it as part of this publication. Thanks. Uh, questions? first presentation you uh, cited a scarcity of uh, valued resources and uh, recognised material and as we put together 
three maps here, one of which is a uh, you know, slow shutter speed of after the event in Brixton, potentially in something to mobilise and empower people, and it looks like your um, borough wide, uh, London wide map is evidence for maybe 10 years down the line after this is all passed in terms of how much do you see actually, the mapping process as creating that rebalancing of powers being able to say, okay, this is something maybe mobilising people or maybe is it actually putting a block against the, the act? I mean, how, how is it working? It's a difficult, uh, it's a difficult question, I guess, and I guess we all face that. Uh, so I did make the map with a very obvious uh, aim, which was to have... Is, is, is it a finished article now, or is it... No, good? it's still ongoing, because I mean, it's, I mean, London is very quick, and we can imagine to change, and every plan of permission is coming in every day. So, um, to answer, it's difficult. Uh, yes, it's empowering, but it's also scary. Should I release all the information or should I keep a bit? Because, um, you know, so how far do you go and what do you show? So that's why I actually started to map the things because I really didn't know and I was really surprised by finding all these crazy numbers and things. And then I went on actually to sort of try to target the actors because I thought that was more empowering. If you go to your council with this and it's actually like you saw the land for experience and you're also in a deal with this guy on the same I thought maybe this one was more useful than that one. But it actually depends and I think it's a very contextualized really depends on which estate you are, what each history of each estate is very particular. Um, and the great thing about all this is that maybe one year we didn't have all this campaign and so organized. Because when Haygate happened there was even maybe not the only one, but they were very isolated. And now you have an incredible network of very, very strong and vivid really <coughs> So in that sense, that's why I made, I made it and it's been used. And in that sense, I think that's where it meets and where it's useful. And, uh, but to the impact of it, I have no doubt. And I wanted to add the fact that because when we started doing this process, we knew that the state was going to be demolished. There was basically no possibility that anything would happen, even if the whole thing was acquired and whatever. Um, so it was very clear for us that we wanted to document as much as possible and put it out as much as possible so that other states would knew, knew what they were facing. And this for us, for instance, we organized some walks between the Haygate and the Ellsbury, which is nearby. Now the, on the Ellsbury state they're producing similar maps as they're fighting the first phase of displacement of their leaseholders and tenants. So the idea is that really, yes, of course, it's a snapshot of something that happened and that hasn't been stopped. But it's also perhaps, I don't know, I'd say before that it was very difficult for, uh, for people fighting to understand the scale of this and to understand that actually it was a much wider pro problem. Also because the relocation is done on a one-to-one -one basis and if you are within the struggle, it's, you think it's you, I don't know, you think oh, it's me, my neighbor accepted, shall I accept? Oh, it's, it's very much like this divide and conquest uh, strategy. And I think there is also a lie in the public discourse that we should, as I said, and other people, we should address, which is this regeneration thing, which is hiding loads of things that, you know, what is really um, coming up for the next years. So in that sense, for people that are, you know, like in Hague Gates, there was no clue at the time of, what was going on around, what would be the next step of, of it. Um, so in that sense, it's, yeah, I think the situation has changed since. And the fight of a gate is now nourishing all the, most of the housing structures around the world. And just to clarify for people that can't see it, Alain was referring to the visualization map that's over there. People can have a look on the way out, which is mapping, visualizing the uh, developers taking over dispossessed. Council of the States on top of the same map she showed earlier. I think there's a good time to open up a broader discussion. Um, I don't know if we want to bring everybody down. I don't know what. Yeah.
And, and I will, uh, I'll be the lone uh, person up here. I've, I should warn, I've been uh, instructed to rule this session because we don't have much time with the iron fist. So please keep your questions, comments. Can I open something out yes. from that? So, so I just, I was thinking about David's um, point earlier in relation to the question. It was just, that was just asked about, about evidence and, and time, temporality. Um, and I guess I was thinking also about, and I guess this is a question for Matt and Chris as well as anyone else, um, and that, we're, that we're working in different tactical register, registers and different things that we're doing, but one, I guess for me one of the things that's powerful about mapping is, is um, what, what Steve and um, I think said about the points. Uh, and that these were developed out of, right, that these are military technologies that are developed um, to pinpoint. But also because they carry that authority, when you make a counter map that functions very much like a map of power, that okay. map carries the weight of evidence in a way where it can be brought, as people kind of touched on, uh, in the courtrooms. It can be brought into cases of international law, cases of domestic law. Um, and so they're not emotive in the same way because they're intervening in a, a language and aesthetic of policy making or of militaristic power uh, or of states, other kinds of state authority, whereas other maps have this kind of, you know, this, uh, such a beautiful example to, to end on, I think, have this incredibly emotive physicality and materiality to be held in our hands. Uh, and I guess I'd, I'd be curious for us to um, go back to the point of, of uh, this idea of mapping for justice and what it means, and it's like, how do we make those decisions about what kind of, of map we want, or how, how can we maybe have, on the one hand, something incredibly intricate that can be used as evidence, but also maybe um, some stories or testimony can be scraped off of that into something that is more um, powerful. So just, how do, we, how do we not necessarily see these as, as competing forms, or even contradictory forms, but as forms that serve different tactical purposes using different kinds of languages and aesthetics? So, comments, questions? I wanted to go back to the technology thing slightly, especially for the LDPQ kind of thing. You mentioned a cheap side incident with a cross gender. Is that that's the terminology used? Because um, I'm curious as to how you classify potentially archival sources using very honest. And especially in this field where the language has evolved over and is evolving to represent a developing consciousness and identity, but then you're trying to understand historical data through that lens. And I mean, as a librarian, I'm slightly upset that you fail to realize how to deal with the many different tags you need to understand something, but I'm kind of I'm curious as to how you see it going forward see this as a resource for the future or is it you know giving what correct weight and power to each different time scale through the lens that we have now? Well we're being forced of course by by the realities of, of, of language and changing language <coughs> to apply a lot of contemporary terminology to the past. We're not going to be able to use 18th century terminology in any meaningful way on a mass scale people using that and understand what it means. We don't have the, the space to have appendices explaining all this terminology or expect people to use the appropriate terminology um, for the period, for, for, for previous periods when they were crowdsourcing this. We will, however, what we don't have in the Chris OSS so set this map is uh, London as a trial and it's really organized around really broad categories of, of interaction and not of identity um, in that map. 